folks, this is Freezing Inferno bringing you another Series 7 Doctor Who review. This week we're going to talk about Hyde. Hyde, what? No. No. I refuse to talk about Hyde. Instead, we're going to discuss the classic Doctor Who serial from 1967 starring the second Doctor, Patrick Troughton, The Underwater Menace. Now, this story is very interesting for a number of reasons. Well, it was the first story to feature Jamie McCrimmon as a full companion because he was uh, recruited onto the TARDIS crew in the previous story, The Highlanders. And it's also a return to normality of sorts. I mean, after William Hartnell's regeneration, rejuvenation, whatever you want to call it, things were a little weird. In Power of the Daleks, the Doctor was sort of out of it for a while. The Highlanders was a bit silly. But now we've got the underwater menace. We've got proper exploration of a brave, strange new world. And believe me, it's a strange new world. The setting for the story is the lost city of Atlantis. I have literally no idea what the hell just happened. I think somebody somewhere reversed the polarity of the neutron flow or something, because that was just weird. Anyway, now that normal service has resumed, this is Rainy Out bringing you another Doctor Who Series 7 review, and this week the episode in question is Hyde. And just to get the usual stuff out of the way, this review will contain spoilers for the episode in question, so please, if you haven't watched it in full yet, please don't watch or listen to this review until you have, otherwise you will ruin the episode for yourself, and I don't want to be responsible for that. So, our intro then did a nice job of introducing our two main guest characters. They were uh, Professor Alec Palmer, played by Hollywood big-time actor Doug Ray Scott, who's most famous for Mission Impossible 2, and also he was in Ripley's Game and did a pretty good performance there, and Emma Grayling, the empathic psychic, who was played by Jessica Rain. Now, you might be forgiven thinking this was a newcomer. Actually, she's been on, on British TV quite a bit recently, with a TV series that has taken off by storm called Call the Midwife, which is all about the real-life uh, diary of, a, of an ex-midwife. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about Doctor Who. Um, the Ghostbusters reference, I cringed. <laughs> not going to lie. This is the second time they've decided to reference that film. Uh, the first time being when Rose said, Who are you going to call? Sorry, the Doctor said, Who are you going to call? Back in Army of Ghosts. But, yeah, cringeworthy. I'm all for popular culture references and things, but that was just a bit too lame. Even for me. I did, however, like, I'm the Doctor. Doctor what, if you like. That was a nice way to subvert the whole Doctor Who trope that's been going on. That we've had in, like, The Snowman and The Sign of the Daleks. And several episodes. So I quite like that they found another way to reference that. They did this again with, with Neil Cross's other episode, The Rings of Akar... Uh, the ring, I'm almost pronouncing that word wrong. The Rings of Akaten. Uh, they found another way to reference the whole he can't say his name uh, thing. When he said, um, I know things, secrets that was never told, knowledge that must never be spoken. So I like that they, they went a different route with the Doctor Who thing. Uh, Emma being the Doctor's assistant was a very <laughs> carefully chosen uh, word there, as opposed to his companion, because in 70s Doctor Who, I'm pretty sure the companion was referred to as the assistant, uh, more often than companion. Again, my resident uh, old Doctor Who expert, the Freezing Inferno, will probably be able to put me right on that if I've gone wrong there. There's also a direct correlation between Emma and the Professor and Clara and the Doctor. I don't think I have to go there too much, although of course Emma and the Professor is more based on a on a love relationship, originally mutual respect, but obviously the Professor fancies her, and it's fairly obvious that the Professor fancies her, even from the off, even from the intro, even if Emma didn't actually twig until much, much later on. Now, when Emma said that the music room was the heart of the house, I had this vision that, towards the end of the episode, that was going to prove to be a much more important line than it first appeared. It turns out I was both right and wrong, and I'll get to why I was right and wrong when I talk about the ending of the episode. I will just say that this episode was really creepy and atmospheric for most of it, but especially in the first 20 minutes. After the first 20 minutes, the creepiness went a little bit downhill. And actually, I personally think the episode went a little bit downhill. But again, that's to be covered a bit later on. Uh, ignorance is Carlisle. 
I think the BBC might just be getting a few complaints from that part of the country. I mean, certainly if I lived in Carlisle and I was told that we were ignorance, I would not be happy about it. But personally, I thought that line was hilarious. Not because I have anything against the people in Carlisle, I've actually travelled there on a couple of occasions myself. It's not a bad part of the country, but I just thought that was quite a funny line. Now, one thing that really helped to add to the suspense and the tension was, again, much like in last week's episode of Cold War, they didn't show off the monster in all of its glory until right at the end of the episode. You just saw little glimpses, little parts of them. Uh, I think in one case the monster just ran across the screen, but shadowed, so you couldn't see what it was. It wasn't until the Doctor went into the bubble universe, or the pocket universe at the end, you actually saw the monster in its entirety. And that was quite a good way of building up some tension and some suspense. And also to leave things up to the viewers' imaginations. In the past I've said that maybe it would be nice if they showed us more, but then you get the opposite end of the spectrum, that if they show you too much, there's nothing left to the viewer's imagination, so you kind of have to strike up a balance. The uh, the chalk circle that suddenly started smoking or was set itself on fire, that was a really good uh, visual effect. I'm not sure if they ever actually explained within the context of the plot why the area in the circle got cold and later later on the rest of the house went cold and the windows actually froze up in the presence of the ghost who of course wasn't a ghost but again more on that later on I'm guessing they were just using general ghost story uh, logic where ghosts are considered to be cold and they can freeze the blood or freeze the room I'm pretty sure I've seen that happen in other ghost stories so maybe that's why they didn't explain it because they felt they didn't need to because the established genre had already explained it for them and having said that this was predominantly a ghost story, there was actually a surprising amount of humour for a story of this nature. Alright, as I say, there were creepy bits like the short circle, there were frightening bits like I'm not holding, holding your hand, Clara. But we later find out that wasn't actually frightening in the slightest because, again, they explained that, or did they, at the end of the episode. But yeah, there was, there was quite a bit of humour. There's, there's a fair amount of humour in, in most Doctor Who episodes unless they go for super serious, like in Dalek. But, um, oh, in fact, I don't think there was that much humour in Cold War last week, apart from the Barbie doll, and maybe Ultra Vox do they split up, which I still think is a fantastic line, by the way. But, um, yeah, there was a, there was a surprising amount of, of humour, and some of the lines were really funny. I'll, I'll, the lines that I found particularly funny, I'll give more of, a, of an honourable mention a bit later on. Um, I loved the scene with Professor Palmer and the Doctor in the dark room. I might have been reading way too much into this, but I love the symbolism that the red light of the dark room perhaps represented the blood on their hands. I mean, the Professor uh, Professor Palmer and the Doctor, they were quite similar characters in, in a lot of respects. They've both lived through a terrible war, they've both caused people to die in their, in their past, and they're both haunted by those that they've either killed or caused to have killed. They also have very strong relationships with their companions, of own, in the Doctor's case, his bond with Clara is still developing through the course of these first few episodes. Whereas with Emma and the Professor, the bond is a lot deeper because presumably they've been together for quite some time. I know Emma is quite is still young, but it's 1974 and the Professor, it hints that the Professor started this after the Second World War. I mean, obviously, he couldn't have started it immediately after the Second World War because Emma would have been, judging from her age, I think she's what, in her in a late 20s, mid 30s? She wouldn't have even been born, almost. <laughs> after the war. We also got a bit of uh, foreshadowing towards the Doctor's darker side when Emma tells Clara, don't trust him, there's a sliver of ice in his heart. I have to fe I have to believe that's going to maybe come back later on in the series finale, or maybe it was just a line, a generic line to symbolise the, the darker side of the Doctor, because we all know from watching numerous episodes the Doctor does have a darker side. He has killed people, he has caused people to die on numerous occasions, although sometimes it wasn't his intention. Sometimes it was, don't get me wrong. There's, there's way too many examples to to give here, but he is quite a dark and, and a quite a flawed character, so I quite liked Emma's line about that. Clara again shows that she's very quick to grasp the whole concept of time travel. However, there's also a very pivotal moment on this uh, on this aspect, which is very akin to Rose's reaction in End of the World, where Clara is truly overwhelmed by the very idea that... the whole idea of the time travel for the very first time. Her line of, we're all ghosts to you, we must be nothing. 
because the whole point is that she's a paradox. They've just visited the death of the Earth, so obviously she has been dead hundreds of thousands of millions of years and is somewhere out there in the ground. I think she even mentions that she might be in the ground somewhere. So I, I quite like that, and again, brings up the whole Doctor's darker side. I do feel that, generally, the episodes that really focus on the Doctor's darker side, like the Waters of Mars, like Amy's Choice, and there I go giving examples when I said that I wasn't going to, <laughs> but go figure, they tend to be better, quote-unquote. Again, as I say, your mileage may vary, and your opinion will definitely vary to mine. It was also quite nice to see the spacesuit make a return appearance from uh, Impossible Planet, The Satan Pit, and The Waters of Mars. Although, for some reason, I think it was missing its patch that it had on during those episodes. I don't think it was a different spacesuit, it was the same colour, and I think it obviously was meant to be a reference to those moments in the past. In fact, there were a couple of references to old stories. Obviously, the blue crystal from Metabellus 3. I think Matt Smith actually mispronounced the name of the planet. I think he, he called it Metabolus 3, and I think it's Metabolus 3. But again, <laughs> old Who people come out the woodwork and tell me if I'm right or wrong. But the uh, the crystal from that planet <laughs> is a reference to the Third Doctor's time. Uh, it appears in the Green Death, and in the final story for John Pertwee in the Third Doctor, Planet of the Spiders. So it's nice to see some old uh, Doctor Who references. There was another one, of course, with the Eye of Harmony. It was Gallifrey's power supply of sorts. It brought back horrible memories of the of the of the Paul McGann movie. Not that I think that Paul McGann was a bad Doctor. I just think he was a good Doctor in a bad story. And also the Master played by Eric Roberts. Again, Eric Roberts, a decent actor, not the Master. No, 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 no. And the Master gets non-canonically sealed into the into the Eye of Harney. Why do I say non-canonically? Because he's fine and alive and well at the at the, at the the time of Utopia. Just saying. Now, I said that there was a point for me when the episode went downhill. And for me, that point was when the quote-unquote ghost was actually revealed to be Hilla Takorian, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, who was a time traveller stuck in a pocket universe. We explored the possibility of pocket universes or bubble universes before in New Who, in, in The Doctor's Wife, and I'm fairly certain there must have been at least one old Doctor Who story that also explored that possibility. I did, however, like the fact that it was a, it was a twist on your traditional ghost story. That part I thought was clever, but I do think that after we found out who the ghost was, and that we found out it wasn't a ghost at all, things did go downhill quite a bit. On my second watch, actually, I noticed that when the um, the ghost appears in front of Emma, or the first time the mirror... Or the, or the gateway, I thought it was a mirror at first, it was actually a gateway to the pocket universe, appeared in front of her. You can actually see, if you look closely, that it's a flesh and blood woman, and you can actually see it's Hilla Tukorian. Of Obviously, at that point, you didn't know it was Hilla Tukorian, so they did actually show you it wasn't a ghost about ten minutes prior to officially revealing that it wasn't a ghost. I'm not quite sure where I was going with that, but I, I think you can probably get... Well, no, maybe you can't, but <laughs> I think you can probably get what I'm what I'm aiming at. It was nice to hear the line Geronimo again. We've not heard that in a while, and in this context it made perfect sense because he was jumping straight into the pocket universe. In fact, I honestly can't remember the last time we've heard it since the Big Bang, when the Doctor uh, travels into the Pandorica and his final message to him is Geronimo. I like that they actually explained that the knocking they kept hearing was actually the monster banging around in the pocket universe trying to get out. I quite like that. And I really liked that it was the Doctor's curiosity of what was causing the knocking that led to him being stranded. Because if you remember, the monster knocks on the door, he goes, Oh, that's what it was! And as he turns back to the pocket universe, Emma can't maintain the link to the gateway, and it disappears, along with the Echo House. And it's not the first time that bad things have happened because of the Doctor's curiosity. If you catch your mind back to Cold Blood for a second in Series 5, poor old Rory was erased from time simply because the Doctor stopped to reach into, into the crack in cold blood and pull out the piece of the TARDIS, which led to him being shot, falling down next to the crack, and being wiped out of history. And that's only one example of a time when the Doctor's curiosity has caused something really bad to happen. But again, there's not time to list every example. I'm sure you'll have pulled your own examples if you've watched the series as long as I have. The new series, that is. Now, the cloister bell going off was kind of a surprise, because I actually thought it was only meant to ring 
in the case of the end of the world or the universe, I think that's pretty much how it's been done in the past in um, since the revival, the 2005 revival. It was used in turn left because it was the end of the universe, because all the reality was sort of collapsing in on itself thanks to the machinations of Davros and the, and the Daleks and the reality bomb. It was news in the waters of Mars after the Doctor went too far and changed history and then the Master came back in the following episode, so it, it made sense there. But I'm not quite sure if the cloister... Well, that was an effective, um, it was an effective thing to show. I'm not quite sure if it was news in the right context here, but I have to admit, I did like it. I also like the little face-off between Clara and the TARDIS. Again, the TARDIS doesn't seem to like Clara. This is the second episode now. It wasn't so much referenced in, in, in Cold War, but it was referenced heavily in the Rings of Akaten when she couldn't get into the TARDIS. Again, she can't kind of initially get into the TARDIS. And I did like the little face-off between Clara and the TARDIS speaking to her via the voice interface. And the line about... Um, Clara being the person that she held in her in most esteem, and Clara's reply of, you are a cow, I knew it. That was funny, but it didn't really fit Clara's character that well. Alright, so Clara's confident in her own abilities, but she hasn't really come across as egotistical that much. I suppose Oswin did back in the sign of the Daleks, but then again, Oswin was a genius, a certifiable genius, but then again, that's another story for another time, otherwise we're going to be getting into the whole is Clara one person, is Clara three people thing, which I don't want to get into until it's actually revealed. The best line of the episode was probably, I am the Doctor, and I am afraid. Because it was surprising that this great man who's lived thousands of years, and is generally not frightened of anything, and rushes headlong into danger and into battle, would be afraid of this. But again, it makes sense. This line was actually in the trailer for the second half of Series 7, and a lot of people assumed it was from the finale because they assumed a, ban a creepy wood setting, and of course the details for Hyde hadn't come about yet about the Pocket Universe, and of course why would they mention that, because that gives away the whole plot. But they thought it was it was trends the law, and he was saying, I'm Doctor, I'm afraid, because it was the finale and he was perhaps going to die, or thought he was about to die. So now that we know that that line is from this episode, that means we haven't seen any footage from the finale, as far as I know, in any of the media. And that's very interesting. And now the thing that wasn't good about this episode, the thing that for me kind of ruined it a little bit, there are two plot holes that really drove the story down in my opinion. The first one is minor. When Emma reopens the gateway to the Pocket Universe, I don't see why the Doctor couldn't have just run through it, providing there was time. Although that does the point the problem with that is that would also let the, the monster through and at that point the doctor hadn't realized yet that the monster wasn't a villain it was actually it was actually a lover i can't believe i'm saying that the monster was a lover but it was <laughs> that's the whole point of the episode <laughs> but the major plot hole when the tardis is talking to clara she says that if she well i'll call her a she because she's using clara's voice the TARDIS says, and I quote, Entropy would drain the energy from my heart. In four seconds I'd be stranded. In ten, I'd be dead. Ten seconds, I'd be dead. The TARDIS travels into the pocket universe at the end to save the Doctor. That's fine because the Doctor does mention the TARDIS. It could get in alright, but it couldn't get out again. I went back and played the scene where the TARDIS flies in to save the Doctor several times. And, nerd that I am, I actually counted how long it took the TARDIS to get in and get out. It took over 10 seconds! So the TARDIS should be dead! So you've just created a rule, and then in the later on that same episode, not 10, 15 minutes later, you've broken it! And to compound things even further, the TARDIS makes the trip again right at the end to save the damn monster! Don't get me wrong, the whole imagery of the Doctor clinging onto the side of the TARDIS is to dematerialise back through the pocket universe, uh, back into the into the real universe, into the main universe, like Jack was clinging onto it in uh, at the start of Utopia. That was really nice, but I can't help but shake this feeling that the show deliberately broke its own rule. It had just established, all for the sake of giving us that one visual, and that is not good storytelling. There could have been other ways that they could have 
There were other ways that they could have done that so they got to escape from the pocket universe, okay? I like that, again, Clara saves the day, and this is becoming a theme, isn't it? She saves the day in the rings with Akaten. She saves the day in Cold War. Now she has technically saved the day in Hyde. So I, I, I like that, but no, I'm sorry. The plot holds right it down for me. I know it's sci-fi, and I know it's Doctor Who, and the plot isn't supposed to make total 100% sense, but no, I think that, for me... Just dread it down, and you are quite welcome to call. Me... No, you're not quite welcome to call me a poop head, but you're quite welcome to tell me that I'm wrong in the comments below. And once the day had been saved, the twists weren't quite over. The revelation that the Doctor had come to uh, Kelvin House not to see the Professor, but to see Emma, the empathic psychic, that wasn't a real surprise, but it did make perfect sense. And again, the Doctor has done this before since the 2005 revival. The whole idea of the Doctor instigating the events of the Rebel Flesh and the Almost People was so he could learn about the Flesh and find out how he could block the signal to Flesh Amy. So again, it's not the first time that he's gone on an adventure solely for the purpose of finding out more information. And Emma's reply about um, Clara was not was ominous by not being ominous. But the way she was saying she's an ordinary girl, it really kept you guessing. Was Emma telling the truth? Or was she lying? Was there a secret that perhaps she felt she owed to Clara to not tell the Doctor because she didn't entirely trust the Doctor because he has a sliver of ice in his heart? I suppose we will find out when the finale rolls around sometime in the next month. I can't believe I'm saying that. It's, it's actually going to be in May that the finale airs. That's just mind-blowing. Uh, Hilita Korean being Emma and the Professor's great-great-great-whatever-granddaughter. That was very cliché to me. I, th I think it was an attempt... I, I don't think they needed to explain why Emma Grayling was the gateway. I mean, she was an empathic psychic. That level of ability, that level of power, plus the fact that it was boosted by the crystal from Metabellus 3, that should have been enough, I think. It didn't need the... You could have just had Halizakorian being a time traveller in the pocket... trapped in the pocket universe. You didn't have to have, them be, have her be a distant relative from the future as well. Now the final twist that the monster was in fact not a true monster and was in fact a victim, that was nicely done. Although the flashbacks where the Doctor's trying to explain how he came to the, re the realisation that he got the wrong end of the stick entirely, it didn't really... I don't understand why these were hints, because it was just Clara saying, I'm not happy, and Clara, I'm not holding your hand. I, I didn't get was the was the female one of the of the monsters trying to tell the doctor what was going on through Clara? I really didn't get that. Or was it just the fact that she she said randomly, "I'm not happy," remind him of the whole "How do sharks make sex?" How how do sharks make sex? Oh my god, how do sharks make babies happily? So yeah, again, I I think that was a. I like, the, I like the twist that all the time you think the monster is the villain, it's trying to break through to wreak havoc, and actually, it's just trying to break through to be reunited with its one true love. And this isn't a ghost story, it's a love story. Ugh, that's a really sappy line, but I guess, in context, it worked. And one final little thing. Uh, the monster was never actually named on camera, although it was credited at the end as the Crooked Man. And this is the last time that I can remember, certainly, that the monster didn't actually get an actual name. And that was back in Midnight, which, by the way, was a terrific episode, and probably one of Russell T. Davies' finest hours. And that made sense, because you never really saw the creature in Midnight, it was just referred to as the Entity, and it just possessed people. And the Doctor referring to the Pocket Universe as the Hex, where he says, he's thrown, she's thrown out of the Hex, or he's thrown into it. This is probably a leftover from the episode's working title. There were two working titles, The Phantoms of the Hex and The Hider in the in the House, or Hider in the House. I'm guessing they scrapped Phantoms of the Hex early because that gave away the twist of being more than one ghost or monster way too early. I suppose, strictly speaking, because the female, uh, or the crooked woman, I suppose we'll call her, although that sounds really strange, uh, the female monster is not in the in the bubble universe, is not in the Hex. I suppose the Phantoms would have referred to Hillary Corian and the Crooked Man, but it still gives away the twist that there's more than one thing in the bubble universe once you know about the bubble universe. And the Hider in the House, maybe the original name of the monster was going to be the Hider, but that is pure speculation on my part.
Overall, then, it was a fairly enjoyable story with some good performances from Douglas Scott and Jessica Rain. The plot started off really strong, but it started to drag a little bit after the ghost true identity was revealed, and the massive plot hole at the end, for me anyway, hurt matters further. I've heard people call this the best episode of Series 7 to date, and even possibly one of the best ever, and to me that's utter craziness. I mean, A Town Called Mercy and maybe even possibly Cold War were better by far. Uh, personally, for me, Cold War was, was better than this week's episode, and I, I'm going to get a ton of flack for that, no doubt, because, as I say, the popular opinion is that this was a really good story, a really good episode, and probably the best in Series 7 to date. I personally don't feel like that, but it was good. I suppose it's a bit like Neil Cross's other episode, The Rings of Echo 10. Great acting, but the story suffers somewhat. And also, perhaps, like The Rings of Echo 10, maybe they tried to do too much in too little time. When they were just focusing on the four of them, the Doctor, Clara, Emma and the Professor, uh, searching for the ghost in the house, there was enough focus there to, to sorry, there was enough scope there to focus on it, on, ev on each of them individually, so nobody got lost in the story. As soon as you found out about Hilla Sikorian and the Doctor going back in time to, to photograph her uh, bit by bit through the ages, and the monster in the pocket universe, it all got a bit hectic. So again, some good moments in there. But for me, not the best episode of the series. But that is just my opinion. Next week's episode, Journey to the Centre of the TARDIS. Now, I am really excited about this one, purely for its location. I know a lot of the Doctor's wife was set on board the TARDIS primarily, but this story looks like it's going to be entirely set there, almost entirely set there anyway. It also looks, from the trailer alone, that we're going to get some more insight into Clara and who she really is. The Doctor says... What are you? A trick? A trap? And I think he's talking to Clara. You can't actually see who he's talking to outright because they have their back to the camera and you can only see a part of them. But I think it's Clara, given what she's wearing. The trailer really doesn't show that much, but the concept alone has my interest. So we have all that to look forward to next week. Join me then for my review of Journey to the Centre of the TARDIS. I hope you enjoyed this review. As I say, if you've got any points to make, anything you disagree with what I've said, please don't hesitate to let me know in the comments. Just just keep it civil. That's all I ask. So until then, bye for now. <laughs>